Good evening, and on behalf of Sheffield Heritage Open Days, welcome to Music, Art and Activism, Cultural Creativity and the Miners' Strike. My name is Janet Riddler, and I coordinate the Heritage Open Days programme across Sheffield for Sheffield Civic Trust. Heritage Open Days is the country's biggest festival of heritage and culture and takes place every year over 10 days in September. Events are completely free to attend and most are organised at grassroots level by local volunteers who are passionate about their heritage, whether it be historic buildings, our natural environment or the cultural heritage of our local communities. Last year, it was a pleasure and a privilege to work in partnership with the All Grief Truth and Justice campaign to put on a special Heritage Open Days event at Sheffield City Hall from Peterloo to All Grief, 200 years of people power. This event brought together music, poetry, discussion and comedy to celebrate and commemorate the struggle of our communities over the centuries when faced with hardship and injustice. So I am delighted that this year the OTJ campaign have again worked in partnership with us to put on another event for Heritage Open Days, which will explore and celebrate the power of the creative arts when artists, musicians and activists come together to make their voices heard. The creative arts have always been a powerful expression of our cultural heritage, reminding us of the struggles and achievements of past generations. The artists, performers and activists you will hear from tonight continue in this tradition of using the arts to address political and social issues in a way which celebrates the links between heritage, art and action. Thank you to everyone who has made this event possible. Enjoy the evening and I now hand you over to Sophie Wilson. Hello. Welcome. Welcome to the All Grief Truth and Justice campaign's second Heritage Open Day event themed around music, art and activism of the minor strike. And before we start, I've just got to go through a little bit of housekeeping. So we expect to finish at around 8.30pm. We have live captions, the link should be in the comments or down below. Um, and the whole event will be recorded and posted on our website for you guys to watch back at a later date. There's a chat function available and um, please do post in there with any comments, memories, stories, etc. But just remember to keep it clean and comradely and we will be monitoring this so we won't get any nasty surprises. Um, the other thing to mention is um, please donate to us and um, the Org of Choose and Justice campaign it relies on donations from people like yourselves. Um, but if you do, please donate through the PayPal which is on the website, um, it should be down below here, and that is the only way to donate um, to our campaign. So this is the second time running a Heritage Open Day event, um, and we're re really grateful to those at the Sheffield Civic Trust for putting on this brilliant cultural event, which is still running up until the 20th of September. Last year's event, um, I spoke at it, um, lots of us are involved, we're involved this year too, it was brilliant, it was at Sheffield City Hall, where, as Janet said, we had the theme from Peterloo to Orgreave, where we looked at 200 years of people power. As some of you might, might remember from that event, one of our panellists was the great Tony Garnett, who was a friend of the Orgreave campaign. Um, and he was a real personal hero of mine, and he sadly passed away since then. So I'm just going to read out a tribute to him on behalf of the campaign. A tribute to Tony Garnett. In September 2019, the Org of Truth and Justice campaign invited eminent producer, writer, actor and activist Tony Garnett to be part of a panel discussion at our Sheffield Heritage Open Day's 35th anniversary of the Miners' Strike event. Tony was a valued and consistent supporter of our campaign and we were deeply honoured to have him as a guest. In 2016, Tony published his memoir, The Day the Music Died. He had a tremendous track record, producing many, many memorable television dramas for the BBC Wednesday play, including Up the Junction, Cathy Come Home, and his films included Kez, Family Life, Beautiful Things, uh, Between the Lines and This Life. Tony's work has always been radical and confrontational, engaging with controversial social and political topics. He was on, amongst the first to put working class voices on screen. 
Tony collaborated closely with Jim Allen and Ken Loach on many productions, including the four part historical drama, Days of Hope. His book is packed full of personal details of his early life in Birmingham, as well as the clashes with the BBC as he battled to make films thought too controversial and then to get them transmitted. The 1977 BBC drama, Meet the People, the first part of The Price of Coal, written by Barry Hines, directed by Ken Loach and produced by Tony, was filmed in the disused Thorpe Hesley Pit near Rotherham, South Yorkshire. On January the 12th, 2020, we were deeply saddened to learn that Tony had died. We and the world lost a tireless groundbreaker. His kindness, solidarity, generosity and support for our campaign will never be forgotten. So thank you, Tony. Rest in power. It's fitting that today's theme of the day is music, art and activism, cultural creativity and the minor strike. The music and art around the minor strike is a great, vibrant and diverse body of work with so many individuals contributing to it. It's an area so huge um, that we just wanted to specify that there's so many great artists out there and musicians. So if you know of anybody who isn't mentioned tonight or they weren't included, I can promise you that this isn't intentional. Um, there's just so many out there doing amazing stuff. But we do have a fantastic array of guests tonight, so I really hope that you enjoy the event. Um, for obvious reasons, 2020 hasn't really been a great year and it's been a bit of a grim time for many of us. Um, and even though we're still having to meet virtually, we just wanted to bring this little bit of positivity to the table. The 84-85 strike was a time, was also a time of struggle and strife. Um, and the legacy of the defeat can still be seen in our communities today. Um, it can be seen with the advance of free market capitalism, low pay, precarious working conditions, low unionisation and the gig economy. But many working class musicians, artists and poets have positively drawn on this time. They've drawn out the positives and the solidarity, um, the class struggle and what that means to us all. Uh, personally, I'm really, really glad that they did that because those stories of hope, resistance and struggle can be passed down and understood by new generations. Uh, it's probably fairly obvious to everybody here that I wasn't born during the minor strike. Um, and even though living fairly close to Orgreave all my life, um, I, I knew a bit about it, but definitely not as much as I do today. And if it wasn't for these artists and musicians who documented and are still documenting the events of the strike, I'm not sure I'd be as invested in this cause as I am today. So as a late teen, um, when I started going around pubs, I would attend a lot of open mic nights and music sessions. Um, if anyone went, there was the Bridge Inn in Rotherham, that was my favourite back then. Um, and anyone who frequents that will know what I'm talking about. And I heard a lot of these stories being told through music. Um, and it was a way that I could understand. So me and my friends, you know, all similar ages, it was something we could really understand and got interested in. Um, it was only then when I truly understood the events of the strike that I could link it um, to today um, and our situation today and how it's affected us and how it's affected our local communities. Um, so yeah, I'm very, very excited for tonight. Um, we've got a great list of speakers and musicians and the first one is the amazing Sam Browse. He's an accomplished folk musician. He's a political organiser who counts Tony Benn and the singer Roy Bailey as his key influences. He previously worked as a university lecturer and has campaigned and organised many movements for peace, anti-racism and against austerity. He's a regular in the pub music sessions of Sheffield and has performed at and organised a number of musical and cultural events. Basically, he's an all-round legend and I'm sure you will all agree, so I'll pass you all over to him. Thank you. Hi, it's a real pleasure to be able to play here today. Um, this is a song that kind of captures what, it, what it's like to, to be, be in the pit and work in a pit. And that's why I thought I'd play it today. It goes like this. Skull dies over, come on then, John. Time to be getting your pit bits on. Off you get with your pack and trousers, time we were on your way. 
time you were learning a pit man's job and learning a pit man's pain. Come on, then, Jim, it's time to go home. Off you get to the pit below. Time to be handling a pick and shovel You start to the pits today Oh, time to be learning a miner's job And learning a miner's pain Come on and die It's nearly light Oh, if you get to the anthracite Oh, the morning mist is on the valley A start of the pits today Time you will learn in the colliers job and then in a collier's bank For school days over Thanks very much, hope you enjoy the evening. Thank you, Sam. That was absolutely brilliant. Um, my name's Chris Peace. I'm one of the activists on the All Grief, Truth and Justice campaign. And I'd just like to say it's an absolute pleasure and delight that we've been able to put this event together for you. It was music and drama that brought me to Sheffield uh, to teach uh, in one of the secondary schools here 27 years ago now. Um, so it's been very close to my heart. The activism of our campaign gets stronger and stronger. Um, and as well as that ask, we thought it's important to celebrate the role of music um, tonight, um, as well as the role of art. But I get to chair the music panel. Um, and I think, you know, the, in our movement, um, it's important to remember what's gone before us. Um, and I'd like to start just by playing um, a short video. Um, and this is of the actor, singer, um, and civil rights campaigner, Paul Robeson. Um, many of you will know he formed a strong bond uh, with the mining communities in Wales, uh, and in Scotland, him himself was a victim of McCarthyism um, and he's very famous uh, for this absolutely beautiful rendition of this great song, Joe Hill. Um, this was filmed in 1949 uh, when he sang it to the Scottish miners. Let's have a watch. Didn't I saw Joe Hill last night? Alive as you and me, says I, but Joel, you're ten years dead. I never died, says he. I never died, says he. In Salt Lake City, Joe says I am standing by my bed. They framed you on a murder charge, says Joe, but I ain't dead, says Joe, but I ain't dead. And standing there as big as life and smiling with his eyes, says Joe, what they can never kill went on to organize went on to organize 
I dreamed I saw Joey last night, alive as you and me. Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead. I never died, says he. I never died, says he. Amazing. The, the year of the strike saw so many people um, use their musical talents uh, to really get support for the miners and their families, um, as well as putting on events and exhibitions. Um, you know, at the end of the day, they did raise money that helped uh, to keep those, those uh, families uh, out of poverty, uh, to keep the strike going. Many of those names are very familiar. We were share, sharing some of the images. I'll just name a few. Um, I will miss some out. It's not intentional, but we do remember the likes of Billy Bragg, uh, Bruce Springsteen, uh, who um, shared uh, his huge generosity in a very large amount of money that he sent to the uh, Durham and Northumberland Miners Association, Paul Weller, uh, Tom Robinson, Paul Heaton, personal favourite of mine, the test department. Um, and that, that tradition continues uh, today. Uh, we have great musicians uh, who have supported us uh, tonight, um, but also have supported us uh, throughout our campaign. People like Joe Solo, who has done um, many gigs for us on our behalf. Uh, people like Grace Petrie, um, the list is a very long one, um, but we also, um, you know, wanted to just uh, pull out a few of these people um, and particularly during COVID, they've been uh, campaigning hard as well. Uh, people you will have seen uh, like the Faction Quiet Lona, um, Steve White and the Protest family, Louise Distras. Um, um, I, I do apologise if I've missed any out, um, but I would like to just mention uh, one very close to home to us here in South Yorkshire, um, and that is uh, The Hurriers. Um, the Hurriers are a great band, um, and they wrote a song for us, um, which was on uh, the Orgreave CD that we produced for the 30th um, anniversary called Orgreave Justice. It's sold out, I'm afraid, you can't buy it. Um, but they wrote a song called Truth and Justice, and I think it'd be great if we just have uh, a quick blast of The Hurriers. Um, 
we try to make our events and uh, rallies when we can meet in person, always have some music there. So if you've been to any of our things, you will have heard um, from people like Grace Petrie, uh, The Fates are another great group that joined us last year at our Heritage Open Days event. Lily Gaskell has done at our rallies. Um, and we had a great relationship with a band called Public Service Broadcasting, who very kindly um, produced a T-shirt that they sold on their last tour um, for Justice for All Grieve, a collector's item now, they've all sold out as well. Um, our rallies wouldn't be um, the same if they didn't have music on them, and we are nearly always joined by the Unite Brass Band and the PCS Samba Band. Uh, who always bring a real vibrant feeling uh, to, to the state of play at events. Um, we also uh, just want to give a little plug here to something that another great stalwart of the uh, music protest scene, Rob Johnson, is doing. Rob has written an amazing song all about Dennis Skinner. Uh, that is getting launched tomorrow night. Um, you can check that out on Facebook. I think we'll be dropping the link in the chat. Uh, if you go on to the Dennis Skinner Single Launch Facebook event page, you can register for the event that takes place uh, tomorrow at half eight. It's going to be absolutely smashing that. Um, so we're going to start with a bit of a discussion. Um, we've got three amazing speakers. I've mentioned the role of Unite Brass Band. Uh, they proudly lead off our rally every year because, of course, if you come from a mining community like so many of us on this, uh, this call do, um, that you only have to hear a brass band and you're immediately taken to that certain place. Um, but brass bands are not dead in the dust. They didn't go when the pits uh, closed. Uh, and to hear a little bit about our brass band heritage, uh, but also what is happening these days and the, and the work that still goes on. I'm now going to invite our first speaker, uh, which is Melissa Madison, and Melissa is the chair of the fantastic Unite Brass Band. Good evening, everyone. Thanks very much for having me. So as Chris has said, I'm uh, Melissa Madison, chairperson of Unite the Union Brass Band, and we're a brass band based in the city centre of Sheffield. We perform um, every year at the annual Orgreave March in support of the Truth and Justice campaign, and we perform at various engagements, various concerts, marches, competitions and tours, um, throughout the year and in our time of, with what we do. We've recently completed a tour of Germany back in 2018 in the city of Bochum, which was a huge success. And we very recently were crowned Yorkshire Area First Section Champions in quite a prestigious competition just prior to lockdown. And that's an achievement that the band's very, very proud of. So we were originally called the Sheffield Recreation Band that was formed back in 1900. And the band performed and, and rehearsed throughout the city in various different guises and then uh, they started to to gather some sponsorship and a bit of momentum and in 1988 was sponsored by the Stocksbridge Engineer and Steels Works and it was around that time just after towards the early 1990s that the band was featured in the movie The Full Monty which centred around the struggle of steel workers after their jobs were lost. The band almost folded after this period, actually. Sponsorship was lost at this time. Player morale was quite low at this point, and uh, a core group of players stuck together and really helped to resurrect the band. And then the band received some sponsorship again from the Esther Stocksbridge um, sponsorship, and that was around 2000, and they maintained that for a couple of years. And then it was 2012 when we were approached by Unite, who were really keen to have a brass band to support a lot of the events that were going on, the Durham Miners Gala, the various different rallies that were occurring. They were really keen to have some uh, musical involvement in that. And we were very fortunate to secure some sponsorship from Unite in 2012. And I think it's that sponsorship that makes a huge difference to, to bands in terms of their exposure. You're able to widen your area of impact your financial stability um, is much greater because you've got that backing behind you to do what you want to do and, and to continue to, to perform the music you want to perform and influence those areas that are so important and forging links really with other relevant organisations and we've been able to do that in such a greater capacity with our, our sponsorship and our partnership with Unite to be able to, to reach out and, and widen the types of events that we do and our area of impact is, is much greater 
and we've been able to go and perform in much further reaches of, of the country than we've been able to necessarily do before. And it's been really, really great for the band to be able to do that. And we've also been linked now to, uh, to the political landscape and particularly been able to, to make a, an impact on struggle and protest and how that is, that is brought into the public the public eye and it really does make a difference. Some of the key events that we do perform in are the All Grieve March every year. We've performed at Save Our NHS. We've performed at Swindon with the Honda campaign, Save Our Honda campaign and uh, Save Our Steel event at Sheffield City Hall, as well as Barnes Lily De Pay Rise. So we've really had the opportunity to represent Unite and, uh, and provide that, that music that makes such a difference at, at these particular events. And I think Mining Heritage and brass bands really do go hand in hand. When the pits were alive, and there were many of them back in the 50s, 60s and 70s, each colliery had its own brass band and the miners would rehearse and, and play brass band music together. And it's, it's very much a cultural um, activity that's taken place over a long period of time. And marching in music, which is what brass bands are, are all about and have been about for many years, really brings everybody together. And it gives an opportunity to sing together as well. So whenever we do perform in an event, we always ensure that we are performing marches so that we can, we can have that music and that, that beating of the drum that, that really does support the march and makes it heard from a distance and, and makes people wonder what's happening there and just, and just adds that sense of atmosphere to what's going on. But we also make sure that we provide entertaining pieces as well. So if we are stood still at a Leeds Pride event, that we're entertaining the crowd and we're able to get people really proactively taking part in it and, and singing together and raising their voices and joining in with what's happening. And it becomes a real celebration for everybody in music. It really does sit at the heart of that. And we're proud that we can bring that aspect out whenever we're out performing and, and representing the union and representing the band with what we do and it really does build interest and, and add momentum to what's taking place for us but also for the message that's trying to be be put across really so brass bands perform that's what we do we perform regularly at colliery clubs at local welfare halls and as chris has said earlier mines might have disappeared and collieries might have gone but the brass bands are very much still alive and that's that's what keeps the memory going really we're there we still perform those venues that, that used to be there, we, we, we're still there performing at those colliery clubs and those welfare halls. And of course, brass bands represent their local collieries and their, their local trade unions at the Durham Miners Gala that takes place in July every year. And the, the gala itself developed out of miners' trade unionism. It was first held in 1879 and developed into the largest unofficial miners and trade union gathering in the UK. Banners are taken on foot through Durham, the banners that, that represent those collieries and those mines, and each band proudly marches their respective banner through the cobbled streets of the city. And it's something that, that everybody is very, very proud to do. It keeps the memory of those collieries alive. And people who are watching the parade will often look out for, for pits and colliery names that they recognize, and they'll look out for those banners that are being marched through, through the city. Each band stops outside the county hotel where they will perform a piece of music for the dignitaries that will stand on the balcony and, and watch the parade and watch the, uh, the bands and listen to the music. Ed Miliband was present in 2012 and he gave a speech at that time. And I think he was the first time that a Labour leader had actually spoken at the event. So that was quite a significant, significant year for the gala. The gala has grown over the years and more and more trade bodies and unions now are represented, which is why again, back in 2012, Unite approached us and, and were keen to be involved in that. And we've proudly marched in the banner for Unite and the huge blooms that are, that are recognised. When you look up the streets from the, uh, the county, you can see the balloons in the distance. Everybody knows that Unite are, are on the way. So it's quite, a, quite an emotional day for a lot of us. I'm a North East girl myself, so I've played in the, in the Durham Miners Gala since I was, I was a kid. And uh, it really is something that I look forward to every year so we do we do hold that with a lot of pride it's a, a highlight in our calendar really that uh, we, we thoroughly enjoy to to perform there and uh, we we hope to be there again next year and uh, proudly lead the Unite banner once again thank you to uh, Melissa and um, 
I think you've uh, you've really made me <laughs> think back and miss about um, hearing you play uh, live this year, both at our rally, and of course we uh, we all miss uh, miss being at Durham uh, Main Miners Gala earlier on. So um, just to um, hear a little bit and keep it alive, uh, we're just going to hear two very uh, short videos of the amazing Unite Brass Band in action. Right. Um, I'm going to move on uh, to our next speaker, um, who uh, we've had a fantastic relationship uh, with the organisation that he's from, Lesbians and Gays Support the Miners. If you haven't seen the film Pride, uh, you must watch it. Make sure you do that as soon as this call finishes uh, tonight. It tells the story of the London and Lesbian Gay Support the Miners um, and the work that they did to show solidarity um, and to uh, raise money um, for miners in South Wales. Um, they put on an amazing concert that features in that film known as the Picks and Perverts concert, uh, as well as many other things as well. Um, but to hear it uh, from the horse's mouth, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce great friend and comrade of the campaign, Mike Jackson. Mike, tell us all about it. I hear everybody. Uh, and thanks for the organisers, by the way, of, of this event today to support uh, Aubrey Truth and Justice. Brilliant. That's Unite and Sheffield Heritage as well. Um, yeah, um, so the miners' strike had been going about three months. Uh, so that was March to June, July 1984. Uh, I was a volunteer on uh, an organisation called London Lesbian and Gay Switchboard. And uh, the person who interviewed me to be a volunteer on that was a, a young man, about six years younger than me, called Mark Ashton. Uh, Mark uh, was also, as well as being a volunteer on Gay Switchboard, he was involved in lots and lots of community things. He was involved in his tenants association. And he'd also recently been uh, made general secretary of the Young Communist League. So when I started working on, on Switchboard as a volunteer, I naturally became very good friends with Mark because I also was a socialist as well as being an LGBT activist. And just before the 1984 Gay Pride March in June, uh, I bumped into Mark and he said, hi Mike, how about taking a couple of collecting buckets and taking them onto the uh, Pride March on Saturday? And I said, yeah, good idea. Uh, and that really is, that's the beginning of the entire story. Uh, the rest, you can, as Chris said, you can watch on the, uh, by watching the movie Pride. Uh, we went on that march. We were quite uh, very pleasantly surprised how much support we got from the lesbians and gays on, on the march. Uh, not just financial support either. I mean, so many people hated the Thatcher government uh, and expressed themselves like that. Um, we formed Lesbians and Gay Support the Miners. I won't go into too much detail about that, but we, we met weekly on a Sunday. Uh, the first priority at every meeting was to uh, collect the money from the previous week's uh, collections and set up a rota for collecting for the forthcoming week. Uh, and that was mainly done outside lesbian and gay venues. If, they were, if the managers were friendly, we'd collect within the venue but most lesbian and gay venues the management were not friendly towards us so we had to collect outside in the street and we also collected outside a, a, a well-known lesbian and gay bookshop in, in London called Gay so a bookshop um, so very much collecting money and occasionally clothes and, and food etc was, was our number one aim with this uh, and of course, um, supporting the miners' cause and so letting the LGBT plus community uh, be aware of what was happening. Uh, the media, of course, including the BBC, uh, told lies about the miners all the time uh, as they were telling lies about our own community. So we were able to act as a conduit 
from the mining communities to speak, as it were, live to the uh, LGBT communities. And I'm, I apologize to some of the younger LGBT people who might be watching this, but it was called Lessing as a Gay Sport in the Miners because uh, this is 35 years ago, things have changed now. Uh, thankfully, we're even more inclusive now than we were then. And so when I say lesbian and gay, I include LGBT plus. Um, we knew that having a a great way to make money. Hard owned about the time of the miners' strike was just becoming quite famous, uh, being part of a band called Bronsky Beats. And Jimmy, who was a working class background, he was from Glasgow, uh, he and Bronsky Beat were very happy to put on a benefit, so they headlined a benefit. Uh, we had other people too, which I'm afraid age has taken its toll. We have had to look up who was on with us. There was a, 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 a people called the Moonlighters. Uh, there were two comedians, Simon Fanshaw and Bernard Padden. Uh, there was a drag opera singer called Michael, wasn't me, uh, and a couple of other people as well. And then afterwards, uh, there was a, a, a you know a disco session with an organisation called Movement. Um, we twinned with the, uh, the South Wales miners, and as Chris has mentioned earlier on today, Paul Rolston was a great uh, supporter of the uh, South Wales miners, and LGSM happened to be in Onfloy Miners Welfare Hall once when Paul Rolston Jr., Paul Rolston's son, was there, and we actually had the great privilege to, to meet them. And all, another character that, that um, Chris mentioned earlier, uh, was Dennis Skinner. Well, a year after the end of the miners' strike at the Royal Albert Hall in 1986, uh, Dennis Skinner was one of the guests to appear at this concert. And um, he followed Tony Benn. Now, Tony Benn had just made one of his wonderful speeches. And Dennis just came on and just said, uh, well, I'm not going to do any more speechifying. I'm sure you've had enough speechifying. I'm going to sing your song. And I dedicate this song to our new friends in this movement, to the Bengali community and to lesbians and gays who join us. So here we go. Now I won't be so cruel as to inflict my singing voice on you, but he started to sing Getting to you, Know You from the King and I. And of course you can imagine there were 20 of us in the seats at Royal, Royal Albert Hall, screaming our tits off. Uh, so excited to be marked by that, yeah. So good old Dennis. Good old Tony Ben, good old Paul, Paul Rawson, and good old old Green Truth and Justice. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, Mike. Um, I, 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 I wish I could have been at that concert, but you really brought it to life there. Um, absolutely brilliant. And I think it's important to remember that the solidarity you showed to the miners, the miners did not forget um, and came and joined you on the 1985. At Pride March, but most importantly as well, it was the NUM who then pushed through um, gay rights at Labour Party conference. It was their block vote that helped push that policy within the Labour Party um, as well. So that's two, two communities coming together in solidarity. Long let that may be the case. Um, we have another speaker, our last speaker in the music uh, section tonight. And uh, boy, what an honour this is to be joined by an absolute Sheffield legend. Um, we always have good bands coming out of Sheffield. It has always been the case. It always will be the case. Uh, but this one has a very special part in, in the hearts and minds of everybody in this city. Um, let's just have a little bit of watch of one of their, uh, their hits on video. Here we go. <laughs>
Absolute mint. Um, so we've got John McClure on the panel. Uh, and you know, you you hear that Reverend and the Maker sound, and, and the lyrics have got that working class uh, narrative in it. And John, is it right? It's 16 years today since uh, State of Things was released? I think it's 13, actually, Chris. I think you're putting three years on me there, mate. I which, do apologise. Uh, at this <laughs> stage, yours, it feels, <laughs> yeah, it feels like a lot, actually. Uh, thank you very much for asking me this evening. Um, I feel a little bit nervous as M uh, Mike and Melissa uh, were very incredibly articulate uh, in their speech. And um, I guess I'm not really used to uh, standing up and doing speeches so much, but I... Uh, you know, I am a local, a local lad. I'm from uh, the Sheffield area and uh, lean heavily on working class culture and, and on that experience for, for my lyrics and for the for music, for the music that I guess most people know us for. Um, we've had uh, six albums out. We've all gone in the top 20, continue to, to do all right. Um, and I guess that you know, I've always felt like uh, as artistically I draw on, on working class culture so heavily in the lyrics, um, it's only right that I just sort of put a bit back uh, and to that end I've tried to follow what Chuck D calls edutainment which is getting the balance between um, being political and following social activism and representing the local area that you're from but also trying to entertain people without which I think um, the point gets lost a little bit because you start to communicate to smaller and smaller audiences so I've tried to, to strike that balance um, and we did a thing called Instigate Debate a few years back where we, um, the idea was, it was a, during the advent of a kind of mobile phone technology and at a time when there wasn't any televised debates and we were trying to encourage music fans to go up to politicians and to celebrities and to ask them, you know, telling questions about the, the society that they lived in and stuff. Um, and I guess from that, I got involved with the Love Music Eight Racism stuff. This is at a time when the BMP were on the rise uh, in both Rotherham and Barnsley at the time, we organised a big gig. We got the Kaiser, managed to persuade the Kaiser Chiefs and Roll Deep and the Cortinas and various others to come to our area. We did a concert at the Magna. Um, uh, and from there, I guess my activism has been, been there throughout, really. I was involved in the, uh, the Hillsborough campaign. Uh, I grew up less than a mile away from the ground and sang, we're, we're involved in the tour with the guys from The Clash and uh, The Farm and also sang on the record that, that went to number one in the charts and eventually, uh, I guess, the momentum that, that generated uh, culminated in, in the legal stuff, which we felt very proud of. And I, I guess um, that then kind of piqued my interest in, in the Orgreave thing, which was another campaign very close to my heart. My mum uh, was very nearby to Orgreave uh, during that time. And um, I've always kind of felt like Hill, the Hillsborough campaign and the Orgreave thing were kind of intrinsically linked really um and uh, in addition i get the jeremy corbyn uh, song started when i got jeremy on on uh, on stage with us um at a concert over in the wirral uh, wirral live um and obviously that song went and went all around the country and followed him everywhere he went after that event and in turn, he asked us to headline the labor live uh, event the following year and he introduced us on stage uh, so activism, I guess, has been a, an important part of uh, my life. And I try to, um, although I've never spoken directly about either Hillsborough or, or Grieve in uh, my music, um, I've, I've tried to be aware that I've got quite a, you know, sizable social media kind of following and to be aware that the role of an artist or a musician these days, I guess, is not just uh, in your recorded output. But also you're a publisher, right? Everything that you say online, um, it, essentially you're running your own fanzine, I guess, is the way you you have to look at it. So I've tried to uh, to represent kind of the truth and, and as I see it, particularly with regards to Hillsborough and to Orgreave and the precedent that um, those rulings and those judgments set for, for the wider kind of society, really. Um, so, yeah right behind what you guys are doing and feel very honored to have been asked uh, to appear on a panel with uh, legends like mike and uh, obviously melissa we have seen you guys many times so thank you very much for having me chris absolute pleasure thank you so much john for your contribution i can't wait so we can all um, get jumping around to you when you can uh, 
play live again. Uh, we'll, we'll be there. Thank you. And can thank I you. just uh, say thank you to uh, everybody who's spoken on the music panel, um, to um, to John and to Melissa uh, and to Mike as well. Thank you so much for your contributions. Uh, we are going to have uh, another performance now. Uh, this is from another absolute stalwart of the movement, um, the lead singer of Ferocious Dog, uh, Ken Bonsall. Ken himself was a miner for 30 years. Uh, he's intrinsically linked uh, with the movement and through his band um, has, has written many songs about the miners strike, about struggle and about activism. Um, just like all the speakers, he makes it absolutely clear which side he is on. And so Ken's been very kind to send us this political um, message and this amazing performance on video. Hi, my name's Ken from the band Ferocious Dog. And uh, it's a great honor to get this chance to sing some songs that year for the All Good Truth and Just Justice campaign. So something that's very close to my heart, uh, going from being a miner for 30 years at uh, North Knotts at Welbeck Colliery and ending up at Big K telling me in uh, the last coal mine for short in Yorkshire. So, uh, leaving school in 1984, my brother and my dad were on strike, uh, especially in North Knotts, being a, in the minority and uh, staying solid to the end. So, it thrust me into politics and shaped my politics for the rest of my life as a socialist. This one's called the Criminal Justice Bill. <laughs> And they call this criminal justice Tell me where we go wrong Divide and conquer was their weapon But together we are strong Remember the day like yesterday in 1984 The miners, they were out on strike and thought to declare the war We stopped an all battle battlefields, the cavalry advanced The miners, they were ill prepared, they didn't stand a chance They smashed it on into the lines, shields and batons drawn On the day the blow was spilled, the violent beast was born And, and they call this criminal justice Tell me where did we go wrong Fight and conquer was their weapon But together we are strong Paul knew but he was a travelling man, he had no fixed abode He wandered around the countryside and living off the road He lived his life with all the cursing songs for you and me there he's down with the sticks in hand, just longing to be free But the coppers, they will come along and shove the guy around Because he chose a different light, they brought him out of town And, and they call this criminal justice Tell me what did go wrong Divide and conquer was their weapon But together we are strong We set up all the salt to see the British sake of sight Bill says that's illegal as we gather through the night We marveled at the strength of stones, we didn't come to fight But there the screams a mile away as they dragged us from the sight We tried our best to make a stand, we didn't want to move The laws are stacked against you, you're always gonna lose and and they call this criminal justice Tell me where did we go wrong Divide and conquer was their weapon But together we are strong Criminal justice bill 1994 Illegal gatherings and their Eviction laws Eviction laws Criminal Justice Bill Never forget Never forget This 
This one's called The Enemy Within. All the saviors of a nation When the empire went to war Keep the own fires burning But the empire wanted more Turn the wheels of industry In times of want and need Expectation of the miners To feed the empire's greed With a life of constant struggle In the darkness down below in the harshest of conditions where the rich were fear to go All the miners have their dignity, all proud strong working men Their fight goes down in history, likes will not be seen again So with threats and provocations in 1984 To protect their jobs and families, the miners went to war Violence on the picket line, police state on the street Persecuted by the media, the bastards in plain street With the enemy within, for a year they went without The intentions of the government, it left them with no doubt So the battle lines were drawn, and the strike it did begin and that you dub the miners the enemy within. Look around and all the mines are gone. I felt the need to put my feelings in this song. You dare to tell me now that the miners were all wrong. And yes, I am your enemy Thank you, the enemy within I've been Ferocious Dog, lead singer Red Ken Thank you very much and all the best For the Orgreave Truth and Justice campaign Thank you, take care Absolutely uh, brilliant. I hope you enjoyed that as much as we all did. Um, I just want to say that we'll be sharing links um, connected to everybody that you're hearing from tonight um, after this uh, event is uh, over. Thank you so much for all your comments. Keep uh, posting them. We really do appreciate it. It's, it's not too late to share the event. Um, if you want to share so that you can get your other uh, people on Facebook uh, watching you. And remember, it all will be uh, recorded and we'll have that up on our website um, as soon as we uh, can. So you can watch it all over again or you can get people who couldn't be here tonight uh, to watch it then. Uh, now, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to uh, my brilliant comrade sister, uh, Kate Flannery. Hi everybody, uh, thanks for joining us all tonight. It's a real honour to be a part of organising this event um, and to be a member of the Orgreave Truth and Justice campaign. I started off really young in, in politics and was a member of Women Against Pit Closures during the strike, which was a real honour, but also I was quite active in my trade union branch and we, we organised a lot of events to support the strike. But I'm here today to talk to you about art and briefly introduce um, our speakers. But I just want to give a little bit of background in relation to art and, and, and political struggle. Um, art's always played a, an important role in the political struggle as an expression to justify or to challenge. And art can also be entertaining, decorative, even escapist. The wonderful artwork of the miners' proud banners has been a huge part of the mining communities and heritage long before the strike, and many new um, and wonderful pit banners were creatively designed during the year and, and its aftermath. Andrew Turner uh, is one of the artists who produced some magnificent banners and recently produced another beautiful piece for, uh, of artwork for the National Women Against Pit Closure banner. The Lesbian and Gay Support the Miners banner produced by Mark Ashton during the strike was a symbol of solidarity and the recent LGSM banner made by Alice Kilroy was based on the LGSM badge 
that was designed bringing colour and positivity to many events and demonstrations and encouraging uh, other homemade banners and placards to be made, which we saw recently on, uh, on one of our um, Orgreave rallies. Um, and the Durham Women's Banner Group celebrates women in their roles within trade unions, politics and communities. And their first project was a community patchwork banner uh, designed and produced by more than 50 women from the County Durham Coalfield area, marching in its first Durham Miners Gala in 2018. Women Against Pit Closures created some amazing banners during and after the strike, and women from Staffordshire, Barnsley and Sheffield, uh, amongst many others, regularly bring along their wonderful banners to our events. And many plates were also produced throughout the country during the strike to help raise desperately needed money and the profile of the communities involved. A piece of art and literature portraying colour and passion on the front and facts about the mines and the workers on them on the back. In Derbyshire, Augury veteran and active NUM member, the late Brian Martin, was involved in the artwork and production of plates and organised exhibitions. Every badge, sticker, t-shirt, mug, key ring, lamp, ornament, leaflet and poster was and is creatively designed to advance the cause, many of which are now collector's items indeed. Many of the designs for these and the plates and the banners also adorn the walls of activists and you could probably see uh, some badges behind me as I speak. Uh, historians, miners and their families in the form of cards, photographs and, and posters and I've got the Pits and Perverts poster behind me here as well. Of course, we need to mention the Northumberland Pitman painters of the 1930s who produced paintings inspired by the artists' own lives in the areas where they lived, the pits they worked in and the pit ponies they worked with. And the recent Sea and Miners mural, Above, Beyond, Below, created by artist Jamie Holman, was painted onto the side of the pub by Cosmo Sarson. And in addition to the murals, there are a huge number of memorials dedicated to the strike, mining industry and pit disasters in the form of statues and other forms of public art to honour our proud, our proud mining heritage. Even body art and tattoos have also become another lasting tribute and form of art depicting the mining industry and the strike. And on that note, I am absolutely delighted to welcome our first speaker, Craig Oldham, who runs the designer and creative consultancy practice Office of Craig, including producing books, websites, films, exhibitions and objects, also teaching and writing for various audiences. Craig produces a lot of the artwork for our campaign and some of his work uh, will be on screen while he speaks. Thank you, Craig. Thanks a lot, Kate. Um, and thanks to everybody. I mean, it's a real honour to be here and to talk a part of a campaign that's really close to my heart. But yeah, I'm Craig and I'm a designer. I'm from Barnsley, even though I live across the wrong side of the Pennines, as I keep getting told in Manchester. But uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm what's known as a sort of a strike burn in that I was born after the strike, quite literally 10 days or so after. And I sort of grew up in a post industrial Barnsley, which was kind of on its knees really from what what happened with the pit closures and the decimation of what happened to that industry and growing up in that it was hard not to be influenced by that whatever you turned out to do in your career or your life it was hard to not let those things permeate you but I come from generations of miners dad was a miner granddad was great granddad was and my mum was involved in women against pit closures and my dad was arrested at Orgreave, so all of these things make this a really personal thing for me. But it took quite a while, to be honest. I grew up around this, and I think when you're a kid growing up, you sort of you, your own little bubble that you grow up in. You think everybody has the same kind of upbringing as you do. So I just thought everybody had, you know, pit posters in garage, and you know everybody's denim jacket with <laughs> badges. That's what I thought everybody sort of had. And it wasn't until I sort of left Barnsley and went to university and started meeting lots of middle-class people from places like Bristol and London and whatever else that they didn't talk like me. They didn't, they didn't have the same kind of political beliefs I did. And that really kind of started to resonate within me that I actually was really proud of where I came from and wanted to sort of put that into what work I did as a designer and also as a citizen, really. 
And that's been a real kind of journey, which culminated in a book I did called In Loving Memory of Work, which was a celebration of creativity of the working class, uh, all from mining communities. Um, I grew up in and around all these warrior women and women against pit closures that I'm just so proud that raised me that I look at now and, and see solidarity with so many kind of women's movements and you know what Mike said about the movements in those communities and the, all this kind of swell of solidarity that happened it just fe I feel incredibly proud to come from that kind of Barnsley stock uh, and I'm really proud that my politics are worn on my sleeve um, when it comes to creating artwork, when it comes to creating messages to people, I mean, we've just done some work for Offers on Bats to, uh, you know, celebrate key workers and the kind of the immigration policy that's happening in the moment and deeming them low skilled after they've propped this country up for the last six months, I think is really wrong. So I'm really proud that that a lot of my work is incredibly biased, really, which is I'm really proud of because I think people deserve the arts and, and culture to stand up for them, much as what music can do and bring people together and make everyone aligned to a common cause. Graphics, art, posters, badges, they might seem really small little things, but they become symbolic and they've become emblematic of struggles. You just, all you have to look at is call not dull. That's three little words that sum up an, you know, an incredibly complex year of activity and agitation in three words. That is something incredibly creative to me and what, and it comes from working class communities that have been willfully ignored by middle class and ruling class kind of galleries, kind of institutions that they own the territory of telling people, well, oh, this is creative and that's not. And I really, really disagree with that. I think what came out of my communities wasn't just posters and placards and everything else. It was poetry. It was music. It was film. And it was really rich. And that's why that book exists to sort of celebrate that and to you know, partly for myself as well, and, you know, people like Sophie who spoke earlier, other generations that come after the generations that were there for the strike, because this is still important. A lot of people say, why do you care? Why do you, you know, give a toss about what happened at Orgreave? You, I know it was your dad and everything, but why would you not care that what happens to people, you know, that's about truth. How is the truth not in the public interest? Everybody deserves that. And without that truth, you're never going to get peace or justice. And that's why this campaign is so important and why graphics and art, they play a part. It's not the whole thing. It's never going to solve it all. But every, if everybody pulls their part, everybody pulls their weight, maybe we can do something and maybe we can make a change. And I think that's why arts and culture are so important because they can be emblematic, they can be symbolic and they can join people together in ways that you might not have thought of. And it might be, yeah, it makes a joke, it makes you laugh. It might be something else that makes you really moved emotionally on another level. But art can do all of those things and that's the real power of it. So if my work is, comes even close to doing a little bit of that, I think I can go away really happy, which is why it's such a privilege to work with Kate and Joe and Chris and Barbara and everybody who was involved in the Orgreave campaign and who represents those communities that I come from as well. I just want to be a kind of good citizen for them as well and fight the good fight. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Craig. Really, really appreciate it. And also, we really appreciate the fact that you designed the flyer for this uh, wonderful event. It's a great flyer and we, we, we really love it and we'll be using it in, in the future. And I'm sure you'll like to use it as one of, in one of your exhibitions in the future. Um, the All Grief Children Justice Campaign has always applied a creative approach to our literature, our leaflets and banners, etc. And uh, we produced an alternative version of a serious crime happened here, initiated by uh, one of our uh, key activists, um, Joe Rowling, using the police incident posters. And every year the campaign's version is displayed on the route of the annual rally march in June, just showing that there was a serious crime that happened at Orgreave and it was because the police rioted at Orgreave. Uh, a creative use of Tory ministers was used for masks at our Halloween rally uh, produced by, um, by Craig. Our campaign is easily recognised by our Call Not Dole logo taken from the NUM badges and stickers of the strike. Um, we've got a blood splattered uh, badge and we know many miners have still retained their blood splattered um, stickers um, and we decided that we wanted to portray it that way. Um, and we've put an, a lot of emphasis on designing our banners and our badges, our t-shirts, our mugs, 
uh, publicity and fundraising merchandise uh, with the help of designers such as Craig, Andrew Fox, Jamie Wallman and, and, and others. So big thanks to all who've helped us with our designs and, and, and a recent big thank you to Neil Terry, who has taken many recent photographs for us. Uh, we do have um, licensing costs uh, issues involved in, in this campaign and it's very difficult for us. It's been difficult for us to put this event together uh, to know what photographs we can use, what images we can use that we don't have to pay for or have license for. And sometimes we do pay those licenses um, and sometimes we get told that we have to. <laughs> uh, but we really appreciate all the, all the stuff that's donated to us as well. Uh, but of course, art isn't necessarily static. It's, uh, we've, we've had the privilege of working with artists who have organised artistic films, walks, clothing and events to highlight the mining industry and political protest. And I have great pleasure uh, to introduce Yen Fong Ling, who is an artist who organised a recent touring exhibition towards Memorial, which will be touring again, involving lesbians and gay support the miners, the Aubrey Truth and Justice campaign and the Friends of Edward Carpenter in Sheffield, using film, photographs and the making of footwear to explore the legacy of class, clothing, LGBT plus rights, social justice and political campaigning. So over to you, Yen. Hi there, thanks for the amazing introduction, Kate. Thank you, and thanks for the invitation to this. I'm really proud and honored to be talking today. So I'm gonna talk about Towards Memorial. And as Kate was saying, this explores the making, gifting and wearing of sandals that were once designed and handmade by Edward Carpenter. Now this is 1844 to 1929 and he was in Sheffield at the late 1800s. And he was a socialist and he was an activist, a writer, a poet, and he was behind the women's emancipation uh, and early kind of formations of kind of uh, uh, terminology around homosexuality. So he was a real campaigner, but he was also a market gardener. And he believed in things around the kind of simplification of your life and how kind of small little changes in, in your, what you do domestically can have a kind of massive impact on kind of manufacturing and industry. One of the things that he did was make sandals. So Carpenter was a designer and a maker, just like we are. <laughs> and these are the sandals. Uh, I have a pair here. So... Um, the the project really came about and it kind of really reminded me uh craig when you were talking about sort of denim jackets and badges that um uh it reminded me of the kind of the uh, the battle of Orgreave exhibition the archive particularly that jeremy della put together and this idea of telling histories through objects and where significance is given to something that might seem very kind of everyday and ordinary and but unlike a historian me as an artist that can kind of go where historians can't so I was able to kind of make an object and explore that history and then potentially engineered where it might go or kind of cultivate a discussion as to where it might go so um, you'll be looking at some pictures as well of Carpenter and some of the pictures of the process that I developed as part of a film that I made. <clears throat> but when I started to work with uh, Noble and Wiley, who were an ethical shoemakers here in the, in the city, we started to have some really great conversations about how the sandal could have been made, what it would have been, what it would have cost to make it during that period, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. And one of the key things that came out was that the, 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 the symbolism that the, the, the sandal epitomizes um, is something that was kind of beyond the words that he was writing. So, uh, and it's something that kind of, you know, his ideology is embedded in the object itself. So he described um, uh, boots, working class boots, as the kind of coffins of the foot. And what he wanted to do effectively was kind of take these sections out and emancipate the foot. 
so it could be free to explore the fresh air and nature and you know connect with nature <laughs> in different ways so you know it's not just the kind of the positive shape that this sandal creates it's the negative spaces that are really really important because they symbolize so much uh, of what he was trying to do support working class people and to kind of free them from you know their kind of the injustices that mm. they were experiencing so it was really important to kind of explore this idea of working collaboratively with a kind of a shoemaker because we could have these kind of conversations and it also kind of echoed um, some of the collaborations that Carpenter did during that time as well. Now the sandals are available to make, you know, shameless plug, uh, and uh, to buy, sorry. <laughs> and, but every 10 pairs that are made, we gift, we gift one to an activist within the city. And it's in this kind of gifting process that was, that we kind of came about working with the friends of Edward Carpenter, who were, who were uh, an organisation who were, who were wanting to put a permanent public memorial to Carpenter in Sheffield city centre. And it occurred to me as I was making these sandals, what if a sandal could be a form of public memorial? That would be kind of like the antithesis of putting a big statue of carpenter in the middle of the city center but what if it could kind of start having a conversation with it so i decided to gift these sandals to the friends of edward carpenter which included kate mike uh, steve slack uh, and mark scott and uh, sally goldsmith and Ronnie Robinson, who are all people who wanted to kind of continue and support Carpenter's legacy into the future. And it was through this that I started to connect with the campaigns like the Augury Truth and Justice campaign and what the lesbian and gay men support the minors were doing at the time. And what you could start to do was kind of map this relationship between Carpenter's history how people kind of embodied and loved the spirit of him and was kind of continuing his work and legacy and how that began to kind of sort of make connections to what Carpenter's ideals have become now and what kinds of car 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 uh, campaigns Carpenter would have supported now. So really, really trying to kind of connect and embody history. So, so where do I fit in? And, it's a really interesting question and I've not really completely answered it, but um, the project has really been able for me to kind of connect to the city of Sheffield and people and places just by exploring what Carpenter did and where he did these things in the city. And I've learned a lot about how kind of socialism and activist, activist sensibility kind of runs really deep in Sheffield history. And some of my takeaway from the project includes all the really, really great time uh, that I had talking to uh, the participants about their political and sexual awakenings and history, and really about a kind of beautiful and inspiring man who needs to be known and celebrated more. Uh, so one of my, uh, a great quote from Mike, during interview was like oppression is oppression. And if I'd been lied to, you know, maybe other women and migrants and working class people had been lied to. And, and this idea that we use public artworks and artworks to congregate around, you know, so, so um, I was learning through this process, I was making this project and, and it's Kate really, Kate said to me, well, you're an activist. And I never really considered myself as that. And it was really a, a kind of revelatory moment myself. Um, but I was kind of thinking, well, if this sandal that I've made uh, kind of carries people forward to fight injustice and connect with what they stand for, well, I feel as if my job has been done. Uh, thanks, thanks. Thank you. Well, that's really great. Yeah, thank you so much for that. And it was a real honor for me to be involved in, in your uh, Towards Memorial. And I know that some of your work in the future will be around looking at different types of public memorials, particularly in light of the uh, Black Lives Matter uh, protests and how we, how we symbolize and memorialize people and who gets the statues and who doesn't. Um, right, just moving on. 
Um, I'd like to introduce some work of, of an artist called um, Darren Caulfield, who's produced some amazing artwork. Dar Darren was inspired by former Derbyshire miner and OTJC activist John Dunn. And uh, Darren created artwork using coal obtained from the National Union of Mine Workers branch at Maltby Colliery. Uh, some of his work is, is on our screen at the moment and he's produced images commemorating the police riot at Orgreave, um, which we showed uh, earlier. But he also produced some interesting portraits, including NUM leader Arthur, leaders Arthur Scargill, Peter Heathfield and Mick McGahey, uh, and minor Davy Jones, who died aged 24, uh, was murdered on the picket line. A portrait of Margaret Thatcher is also represented uh, by Darren with uh, rust uh, on iron. Uh, but now I'm really pleased to introduce Sam Vardy and Paula McCloskey of the Independent Art and Spatial Research Practice, a place of their own. Paula and Sam invited us to be involved in an organised walk and performance, a political art event over the political and geographical landscape of all grieve and treatment. And it was involving LGBT plus anti-fracking, OTJC and women against pit closures and other justice activists. So it's a great honour to introduce Sam and Paula. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks to uh, the organisers for inviting us to talk today. It's a um, real honour to be to be part of this event mm -hmm. um, and alongside all the fantastic speakers that we've had so far and performers and everything it's uh, it's really really a special thing um, so we just wanted to talk a little bit about um, our art practice and specifically the, the walk that Kate's just mentioned um, and I guess a little bit in a moment about just our reflections from that on mm -hmm. what we think um, art can do in these political um, contexts. Um, so I guess we need to say that, you know, we've a long term interest in relationship uh, and role of art in, in politics. Um, that covers kind of our backgrounds in Ireland and in the Northeast. Yeah. Um, from a mining background myself. Um, yeah, and I'm from the, um, we do a lot of work on the, um, um, so in 1984 or um, it was not long after I'd moved over, my family moved over from the border in Ireland over to England and I spent my childhood back and forth with an Irish Catholic father and an Irish Protestant mother from the Republic. So the troubles really marked my childhood and being from this and, and, and this kind of interest of how people become politicised um, in your art making, um, I think that was really formative for me um and 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 the, yes and and about 10 years ago we started working on a on a place of their own where we were trying to find a way to um explore art and activism then from from the home because we were having ch young children um and we we're living in sheffield and this this uh, place of the room is really a kind of a way for us to continue to make our um, uh, um and engage some of the kind of more social and political things that we were engaged with while having young, young children so a lot of our works started with, with have um with working with our, our kids but really mixing with the kind of personal and the political through the art making which has kind of gone forward um as we've developed it was the home we started from and making the family kind of seeing any radical potential of this heteronormative family that we found ourselves in um, but then we're looking out and, and, and then developing other projects from there. So the border in Ireland has been a huge part of our work, but, but then more recently different, different um, other kind of local, but also global concerns. Um, yeah, so. So, so the, the walk that we did um, in Orgreave was um, kind of about our interests in the way that um, different projects and people that we knew and were, and were kind of talking to were involved in these self-organised um, activities against injustice, different kinds of injustices. So we had um, people there from anti-fracking camps in, in, in South Yorkshire um, who'd been exposed to kind of police violence very recently um, and had different stories to tell and different things to think through about some, some of these issues. Um, so 
we, we brought together these different uh, groups, including the, the Truth and Justice Campaign, Anti-Frackers, the uh, Women Against the Pit Closures, um, and artists and so on. Um, and the artist Damien Fisher as well, who um, did a, a performance as part of the event. Query and Cole. So Damien Fisher is, we, yeah, we'll add him to the list of um, people to look up, yeah. Yeah, uh, and we kind of we did a, a, a walk around the, the, the site of the Augury Colliery um, with people and there was something about this kind of act of walking and kind of re, uh, revisiting this kind of site of this past trauma that um, is something that was quite important here and, and we brought in other voices as Paula said about the kind of uh, the global perspective and different voices about mining and injustice from around the world so we we're kind of layering up these different voices from different places all the way through it wasn't it wasn't our voice on its own. Yeah, so the performance was based on um, trying to actually um, bring the kind of audience and participants um, to the site, which was obviously a very uh, charged site and an, emotion, and an emotional space, which we kind of talk, and then talk through, um, yeah, these different voices through um, people who are um, in uh, or other activists and artists globally who are involved in um, um, other kind of extraction um, politics um, and activism. So I think after this event um, and, and, the, and the sort of dialogues that kind of spun off from it and that are still ongoing, um, we I think some of the things that we took from it really were about the way that the kind of art um, can provide a different way to talk about these things from the past. So like Craig was saying earlier on, you know, this question of how, you know, why are these things still relevant now? And I, and I think that these kind of different open-ended sort of practices and dialogues and walks and so on, help us kind of revisit these things in different ways. Um, and also think about the future of these issues as well. Like where, where does this go next and how does it inform the kind of actions and stuff mm -hmm. take, take next? So, um, we're hoping to kind of set up in, in line with the heritage open days and so on future events and future walks, um, which will make, you know, absolutely kind of public through the, the truth and justice campaign. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And yeah, and we really look forward to being involved. We were hoping to be able to spend some time with you over the last few months but um sadly that was not to be but we can see you now and uh, and that will spur us on to uh, make sure that we do do some work together and that's a promise uh just thank you to everyone who's been on the art panel to craig to yen and to paula and sam we really appreciate uh, your input and your um continuing input and support and now I'd, um, I'd very much like to introduce, it'll be a pre-recorded song and a message from um, Ohuli and Tiddo. Um, Ohuli and Tiddo are a dynamic Yorkshire folk music duo, singer-songwriter couple, Heidi Tiddo, and uh, a, song, a singer-songwriter and pianist, Belinda Ohuli, who's also a singer. And their albums and live performances have received many rave reviews. Uh, their recent song, Gentleman Jack, from the album The Fragile, features as the closing theme for a recent celebrated television drama series called Gentleman Jack. Uh, the thoughtful and inventive music is greatly influenced by their Irish backgrounds and the strong themes of class, community and diversity with many moving references to many issues, including industry, migrant workers, war, motherhood, love and sacrifice. However, this song is more upbeat than all that. And it it's alludes to the world of alcohol and the microbrewery. And it's called Summit's Brewing. We are Ohuli and Tido. Hi. And we're delighted to be part of this event. And uh, in the spirit of protest and resistance, we have our little boy Flynn, who is not so keen on being in his cot while we're singing. Uh, a song that we're going to sing for you today from our album The Hum is a song called Summit's Brewing. Yeah, and we wrote this song a few years ago now inspired by um, the real ale revolution um, which has spread across the land 
but we believe that it started in Huddersfield. Um, and at the time, <laughs> microbreweries were popping up all over the town in disused buildings, old mills, sheds, garages, and they're everywhere now. And we thought, wow, that's just, Huddersfield's really known for its fantastic, independent, fierce spirit. We are, after all, the home of the Luddites. And uh, we really celebrate that spirit, that spirit of standing up and doing something different. Um, so this is Summit Brewing. <laughs> Well, what a fantastic evening. Um, my name is Joe Rollin. I'm one of founding members of Orgreave Truth and Justice Campaign. And we've been uh, active now for nine years um, for the miners that were beaten up, fitted up and locked up on 18th of June at, at the coking plant at Orgreave. And um, it's, it's been an absolute pleasure to take part in this tonight, even though I'm only summing, summing up, unfortunately. But the speeches have been absolutely fantastic. I'd like to encourage as many of you who are watching tonight to, to take part in the campaign. You can follow us on social media, all our Twitter page, Facebook page and Instagram are going along the bottom of the screen. If you'd like to get more involved, go on our blog, which is also advertised on the screen. And if you really, really want to get involved, then drop us an email at allgrievejustice at hotmail.com. Having been born in uh, Barnsley, a mining town, I was strongly influenced by the art of the miners' strike, by the banners, the graffiti, the posters, the fly posters, the stickers, uh, the music. Uh, the list just goes on, and it, all, all that imagery and 
and words have stayed with me to this day and, and made me the activist that I am, 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 I am today. Um, in the Orgreave campaign, uh, we tried to keep the spirit of the miners' strike alive by holding events like tonight and our annual rally and, and music events and, and everything else that we do. And it's so important to keep that spirit of fighting back alive. You'll all be looking out of your windows and out your doors uh, over the last six months and, and looking at uh, what's coming down the road as furlough scheme ends in October. There's going to be massive uh, redundancies and the bosses and the Tories are going to come and try and make us pay for the crisis, just like they did in the 80s. So it's really important that people join a union and get involved in their community groups and organisations and, and keep that spirit going. It, it may be 35, 36 years ago, but the fights are still as relevant today as they were in the 1980s. Um, if you're a budding uh, songwriter, poet, filmmaker, banner maker, graphic designer, graffiti artist, whatever you are, and you want to help out in the campaign, drop us a line. The campaign only keeps going because of people like you. None of us are paid in the Orgreave campaign. It's a, it's a voluntary organization. And the more of us that take part, the louder our message will be. Um, I've got a little quote to read out, which I pinched from one of my friends um, earlier today about art and it's from the German playwright uh, Bertolt Brecht and he said that art is not a mirror held up to reality but a hammer with which to shape it and I think that's a great um, quote to uh, describe some of the things that we've heard from tonight. Um, it's also fallen, me to, uh, fallen to me to thank everybody who's took part um, tonight and I'll try and get everybody's names right so apologies if I don't. So I've got Ohuli and Tiddo that you've just heard um, Mike Jackson, of course, from Lesbians and Games Support the Mi uh, Miners. Paula and Sam, who have just spoke uh, about a place of their own. Craig Oldham, who managed to do his entire speech without swearing. Um, it is the first time I've heard him um, ever do that, so he deserves an extra round of applause. Uh, Yen, who uh, did that excellent uh, piece um, uh, uh, talking about uh, Edward Carpenter and the sandal. Um, I think I need to watch that back again to fully fully get that. I think that was, that was excellent. I've seen a lot of people tweeting about that tonight. Uh, Melissa Madison, who plays for Unite Brass Band. If you've not seen the Unite Brass Band, please check them out. Um, they have won a, a lot of awards recently, and anybody who's into the mining communities can't be helped but moved uh, when they listen to them. Um, Ken, who you heard from Ferocious Dog, uh, Ken was out on strike for a whole year, even though he lived and worked in Nottingham. Um, a lot of people um, give the Nottingham lads a lot of stick, but for the brave people who stuck it out, it could arguably even harder for them down there. So, you know, check out Ferocious Dog. Absolutely legendary band. Um, thanks to Sam, who op opened up for us with that really moving song. Um, and if you've not um, heard Sam before check check him out is it plays in plenty of pub around sheffield um d definitely worth checking out and then i can't let the night go by without mentioning um john mcclure obviously from um from reverend and the makers um, one of my favorite bands so to get the privilege to share a, a platform with john is um, a, a real privilege what, what an absolute legend he is and um, thanks to Sophie for opening it up for us and being one of the youngest members um, talking talking on tonight's event, uh, uh, talking at tonight's event. And then just to wrap up, I'd just like to say a massive thanks to Kate and Chris who pulled all this together throughout the summer months. Um, I bowed out of this one and left them up to it and somehow managed to get um, to, to finish off. And then the unsung hero um, is Ryan Case from Unite's digital team. Um, when we first tried to do online campaigning, we somehow convinced ourselves we could do it ourselves. And thank God that Ryan intervened and uh, brought us to our senses. Thanks so much, Ryan. And thanks to everybody who's uh, tuned in and listened tonight. We'll do a recording so you can all hear it back and share it on Twitter and what have you. Um, have a few beers this evening, but don't forget, get involved in the campaign, join a trade union and join the fight back. Thanks so much.